What's up guys, Mike Lewis here and welcome to the Mike Lewis Podcast. If you guys want to keep up with me on social media, you can follow me on Instagram at Mike Lewis Official and you can follow me on Twitter at Mike Lou 52 It's where most of my updates come. If you're enjoying my content, give me a like and a subscribe. And without further ado, let's just dive right into this episode. use um, there are so many uses that are um, available to it and so essentially even hemp clothing is more durable than denim um, it lasts longer and so there are things that they conspired right to kind of ruin the cannabis plant in its good name and its good reputation so for years and years um, people were kind of under this misconception that you are lazy if you're smoking weed. And the reality of that was is that you're smoking the wrong weed when you're smoking an indica. It's going to make you tired, so you're not going to want to do things. I mean, there are just a lot of miseducation, a lot of misdirection. And so the more I started to learn, the more I was just intent on changing all of this it's just like do you even know what this plan is capable of and do you know what we can do to fix all of your ailments almost all that ails you yeah for sure so it's high from the hill right is your website website is high from the hill.com and i just started a uh, youtube channel because i am going to start incorporating just little cooking segments where I can just show people how to do a variety of things from different like alkaline water-based elixirs that are infused with like cannabis and different fruits. And by cannabis, I mean cannabis tinctures. And um, like I said, there's just a whole wealth of information that I have and I just created a platform so that I can share it with other people. No, that's definitely a good idea. You know, like I know like, um cooking tutorials are like a really huge thing nowadays but i can't quite pinpoint you know like off the top of my head like someone that's doing like can cannabis tutorials so you might be like a pioneer with this thing i would love to be one i've been working with a marvelous uh doctor too who has been one was one of the first doctors to publicly advocate um, be an advocate for cannabis usage, not only um, medicinally, but recreationally, but also to treat a variety of different addictions. And so she has been helping me with a lot of my data in terms of the way that I dose people and dose people in these events so that you can actually know what is going on and enjoy what is taking place and all of the benefits. And so she works with me for a lot of my chemistry so that I have science backed behind what I'm doing as well to really have an, um, the legitimacy of knowledge of that. Like I'm not just kind of doing random chemistry in my kitchen without um, taking this data and bringing it to somebody else and, you know, making sure that the science is sciencing and the math is mathing. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I wish you luck with that. I will uh, link your um, website in the uh, description. I could also link your YouTube, too, if it's uh, up and running, if you'd like. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll be happy to share. For sure. What um, I want to, you know, f- flash forward a little bit. So you obviously were at that uh, Mark Long's 50th birthday party, right? Back in, uh, I think it was June, I want to say. June? Was it yes. June? Mm-hmm. What, what was that like? It was, it was fun. I am not the same type of party girl that I used to be. Um, and so for me, uh, it's, it takes a lot to get me out of the house for more than an hour. So it was good to see and meet a whole bunch of people that I hadn't met before and didn't know. And then obviously like reunite with people that I hadn't seen since I flipped them off. So, um, Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was good. It was, Who was that? Really good. Um, well, there was, I mean, it was everybody that was pretty much standing on that platform oh, that, right. you know, right. ended up at his, <laughs> um, party. Long day. I didn't pick up on it. <laughs> mm-hmm. No worries. No worries. So did you have any uh, aspirations of getting onto TV, you know, like when you were were growing up or like what maybe was that snowball effect for you and wanting to audition? 
yeah, I wanted to be on television. I definitely wanted to make my little mark in the world. And so it was my agent that sent me on a casting for the real world. She's like, you'll be great reality television. So go on ahead and do this audition, which was for something totally different, but obviously by the same production company, or you wouldn't know, but obviously it was because they kind of greenlit me for um, the real world fairly quickly in terms of the selection process. They had already done a variety of interviews. They had had some content to go on. So with that being said, it was just kind of really quick, fast, in a hurry that I ended up in Vegas once um, that ball started to roll. And, um, yeah, the rest is history, I guess. So you'd say it was a more fast-tracked process for you? Yeah, I, I definitely remember it being very effortless. Um, I mean, even from the first audition, it was like the first audition, but like I had a line pass. So like I was able to skip a line of like, you know, 2000 people. Then like when I did that audition, like even though the show that originally wasn't, um, that I had been auditioning for wasn't a green light, I ended up being kind of put in position for the real world. And even though I hadn't like filled out the application, which was like 60 pages, because they had sent me a 60 page application. And I saw that it was 60 pages. And I was like, yeah, fuck this. And um, I never filled it out. And then by the time I actually filmed, filled it out, like I had just filled out all these like one word answers, like half assed. And then they were like, you're a semi finalist. And then, you know, when I got to New York for my semi finalist interview, like that was super easy. And then from there it was like LA and then they were just like, you're going to Vegas. And I, when I look back at this, like all of these things, like I didn't see any obstacles preventing these things from happening. And normally if like there's something that I guess is not necessarily meant for you, you find, you know, at like some point in time, like things that you have to navigate, but every single thing. And I remember even the day that I was going on that first casting, I almost didn't go on that casting. I yeah. almost didn't go because like my boyfriend at the time was like, we're going to go to the beach and, you know, living in Massachusetts, you know, sometimes summer is a crapshoot with the good weather and it was a really great beach day. And I was like, do I really want to go into the city and like stand in this line when like we've got this really great beach day? And I remember in the shower, like hearing this voice, like you better go to this audition. It's going to change your life. And I remember calling my boyfriend being like, yeah, I'm going to go to this audition instead. And like this casting rather. And I mean, like, so it's like, even that I look back at like all of these things that could have changed the direction and nothing changed the direction. So for me, I definitely am like, yeah, it was a fast track. Yeah. And I think that um, a lot of people could relate when I say this. The Vegas season, I think, is what really shifted the tide in terms of what direction real world was going in, because we're used to seeing up to that point at least like i could use seattle as an example they were like a like a much darker season you know what i mean like there was a mm-hmm. lot of like, they had like the slap incident you know there was like mm-hmm. instances where they would just like remove their mics and just like go off and just like pretty much like almost in a way self-sabotage themselves on the show um mm-hmm. so it was referred to as like one of the darker seasons of the real world whereas like um you guys, it's like, uh, you know, lights and glam and, um, you know, stuff that kids or teenagers, you know, early 20 year olds normally, you know, wouldn't be doing in everyday life. So do you feel like you guys were like transcendent in that sense? Oh, without question, unquestionably so. Um, and you hit the nail right on the head. There's really no way that a group of like 20 something year olds would be exposed to a lifestyle like that um, penthouse limousines casino all of these things that i mean alcohol just kind of flowing like water because you're living in a casino which just hands people free alcohol every minute of every hour and so it really kind of put us in a position to um 
really take the blame, I guess, for what our experience was in terms of how that shifted the theme of the show and what the show began to represent. And that's interesting because we, as a cast, have no control over the location. We have no control over what they choose to shoot over the time span that we're there. And I can assure you that for the amount of time that we were there, like so much went on. And I still don't know what was shown, but according to everything over the years that I've heard over and over and over and over and over and over again, they refer to it as that Vegas was when the real world shit the bed. It was when the real world really turned into nothing but like a drunken sex romp. It was when everything was just turned into so superficial, but like we weren't having a superficial experience. It looked like that on the surface because that's what was shown, but we had some really significant moments there. Really significant. Vegas was crazy because I always hear people saying um, that it was like their favorite season and like this and that. And for a while, I was, like, you know, on this channel, like, oh, yeah, you know, I really like, you know, real world Austin and stuff. And then, like, mm -hmm. it wasn't until, like, a few, probably a few weeks ago, actually, I just, like, went back and uh, went on Paramount Plus and was watching it. And, like, oh, my God, got me hooked. Five minutes, not even. I was, like, <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> I just remember uh, seeing Steven with his, like, shit-eating shit grin, you know, on the <laughs> oh, my God, in the intro, and I'm like, this is freaking crazy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I can't even imagine, because I just, from memory, the, the, all of the, I guess, kind of like sensorial overload that you, you get when you're walking through these casino doors and all of these things are hitting you. It's not only just the fact that you've got like a camera crew like in front of you with like this boom mic that you're you know, trying your best to ignore and pretend that it's not, you know, that you're not about to trip over them. But then you're like stimulated by like all of these lights. You're Then you get upstairs when you figure it out and you meet these people and it's like all of these people that are you and you're all staring at each other like is this real life are we really gonna live here <laughs> together <laughs> in this kind of crazy it's kind of yeah. crazy that you guys are creeping up now on like this what is it 20 year mark you're creeping up on mm -hmm. yeah just, sir does it even feel real that that's how long it's been no no it doesn't i my memory of that time, now that it's been jarred again, is really uh, significant. And I'm curious to see, um, you know, if my memory, what the things that I remember, you know, kind of align with what was eventually shown um, to everybody else. Because, you know, the, that, yeah, the memory is crazy, it's crazy memory. And at this point in my life, my big age now, I literally, it's really so hard for me to conceptualize that I did this thing upwards like almost 20 years ago. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. So I want to ask you about that one incident at the club. I think it was like, um, I had uh, some of my followers who were filling me in on this and wanted me to ask. Um, I think there was this one scene at the club where some random girl at the club said something in the camera. I think called you like a bitch or something. And then like, I think you guys got into it a little bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Um, yeah, memory wants to resurface about perhaps a tussle of some sort. A little rumble. Rumble was and rain. Was there, any, was there ever any fallout from that or no? No, um, because when that experience happened, um, I also felt that girl push me in the back of my back, like, you know, like really hard. 
And as she walked by me, and that was kind of like the green light for me to, um, you know, defend myself from what I felt like was an assault. And so um, that's kind of why I went after her besides, you know, her probably calling me a whole bunch of names that she shouldn't have been calling me. Um, she didn't know me. And I'm, I think I'm cool. <laughs> like, I think I'm cool. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> yeah, so. I, I was like, uh, I think like they had a lot more, the tolerance was a lot higher, I guess, for like, um, I don't want to say fighting back then, but like violence in the sense of like some things that were done then, such as like hypothetically, if like Bryn's fork throw were to take place in like our current climate, I feel like that might not fly as much. I don't know. It's just. Oh, absolutely not. There are certain things that obviously could not fly as consciousness hopefully has evolved 20 years. And there are certain things that you realize that, okay, um, are you going to cause a big melee in a nightclub, right? If somebody pushes you, right? If like they didn't knock you to the ground, if you're not like fully injured back to that Zen, right? Back to yeah. being Zen and knowing, you know, when, what battles to, to fight and, and pick and choose and things like that. And same thing is just like, how are we handling the fact that somebody may not find you as intriguing or attractive as you find them are we assaulting them with flatware or are we just like man you know what i'll find somebody that likes me too <laughs> and you know go on about it i definitely think um as we've grown yeah a lot of that shit would not fly which i'm glad to see the evolution see yeah. how people have learned from like dumb shit or you know mistakes that they've made and be like oh wow that was some dumb shit i'm glad i don't do that anymore were there a lot of opportunities that came your way post show? Like, did you get to rub elbows with any like uh, well known people? Yes, yes, I was definitely out in those streets hobnobbing with all types of people that I probably wouldn't have met otherwise, and it was really cool um, to be able to live life like that. I mean, even our the fact that our show opened. Um, or like we shot a promo for our show, which had at that time, every single rapper that I was obsessed with from Foxy Brown to Ludacris to Method Man, Red Man. I mean, that was a night that uh, alone changed my entire life, you know, so starting from that and I was just like, wow, you know, and they're just random times that people that you wouldn't expect to recognize you because they're so recognizable and you're just like wait how <laughs> are you how are the hell are you? okay um but I, you've realized that like reality television is a guilty pleasure for a lot of people yeah H how surefire was that uh vegas i think you guys what did you guys re you guys reunited i think it was like five or six years after that season right yeah yeah. Was that like, uh, what was like the dynamics at that time? A lot of people were curious about. Was that like as um, clear cut and dry, or was that did that take uh, you know convincing to get people on board for it? Um. So yeah, we definitely would have. I, I know that there were some people that were like, "Yeah, I'll do it for whatever," and there were some people that were like, mm, "No, let's." make sure that you treat us with the care right that probably yeah. wasn't given to us the first go around and so we all eventually got on the same page and they made it work and we showed up and it was definitely different so different yeah was um why did maybe you have, like, a layoff from Battle of the Sexes, too, like, after that show? Like, did you, um, because from speaking to you, I, I definitely feel like maybe, you know, real world was definitely something, like, you had more intentions for, whereas, like, the challenge was kind of just, like, you know, 
an, an extra thing, like an experience, whereas like real world was more so what you wanted to do? Is that kind of maybe why you only did that first original challenge? Bingo, my kids. So, um, yeah, I wasn't definite. Like that was kind of, oh, something that seemed to be fun. And then after the final, um, it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth um, for it to kind of go the way that it did. Um, and so I wasn't like ready to go on another one or whatever, because I, I personally felt like, oh, um, you know, this didn't feel worth it to me, you know, if like it could happen like in the way that it did at the end. Um, so I was cool with, I didn't have to do another challenge again. Yeah, it wasn't. And based upon a lot of the dailies that they have people doing. I mean, like, I mean, I just, yeah, I wasn't super impressed. Yeah, there was, like, uh, some big uh, urban legend from years ago that, you know, you and uh, Frank were supposed to be a part of this uh, Team Las Vegas for the, some Battle of the Season season that Alton and Trishel ended up doing. Do you know if there was any truth to that? Mm-hmm, that's true. Oh, yeah. wow. So, so. What, what, why did that not come to fruition? Yeah, because, you know, um, see, it just, it wasn't supposed to be. We'll just leave it at that. It wasn't supposed to be Frank and I for that. And so I think everything happens the way that it's supposed to. And at the end of the day, I don't think that would have been a good move. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So now, so now I'm curious. What maybe swayed you towards doing All Stars? You know, obviously you get the availability. Like, what maybe went went through your thought process that was made you be like, okay, I think I want to do this. Oh, I was legit ready to go back to All Stars and win and collect my winnings and use it to start my healing house. Mm. I believed in my heart that based upon my experience with Battle of the Sexes and, you know, what that was, and I'm just like, I can go in and play a very strategic game and make it to the final, and I'll be able to run that final easy, like, completely what was in my head. No question. No, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So I obviously know that, you know, you talked about in other places, you even talked about on your Instagram, but for, you know, maybe those that aren't, entirely aware could you maybe like uh walk me through again like the whole backstory um that went into obviously your untimely exit i guess we can call it um on the all-star season yeah um so one of the main things that i wanted to be clear on right is that before i even signed my contract they ask you kind of you know what the details of your life are right right under the space that said allergies I put severe gluten allergy very big letters before I even signed my contract I was like we're gonna make sure that this is addressed so for me my food needs weren't um, taken um, fully into consideration in terms of the severity of my allergy and so while I was there from immediately from leaving my house and it's not just um about production it says a lot about uh, a lot of establishments across the board because it wasn't I mean it happened in the airport I was getting cross-contamination like on the plane I mean there was literally just like not one place that I could go and safely eat um from when I left my house and that was really disturbing to me because I have been a chef and worked in restaurants, and I have never, ever once poisoned one person. Never cross-contaminated with an allergen. Like, when you follow allergen protocols, it's almost impossible to (laughs) poison somebody if you do it the right way. So, in my whole career, when somebody says that they have any type of allergy, I take that shit exceedingly seriously, okay? And I run down, I'm like, well, this is what's in the kitchen. Like, there's a chance for cross, like, how severe is your allergy so that everybody knows what you're working with. And so for me, I was not treated um, with the same level of care, right, for this production. And so my whole experience from quarantine 
to um, the catering services and even from me personally, um, once I got in control of being able to make my own meals, um, I was just not getting the same nutrition as everybody else. I was probably sometimes going 24, 28, 30 hours without eating because, you know, we're in the middle of um, doing a daily and, you know, they've got salad that I can eat and I can eat, you know, some hot lettuce <laughs> um, and, you know, wait until we get back and then we have to film some more. And so by the time I like get into the kitchen to make my meal um, and that's making sure that nobody else is in the kitchen using the, I mean, it's just, there's 22 people there. It was so much. It was just so much as I talk about it. And it was just really difficult for me to um, get the same fuel. And so I got to a point where after, you know, speaking to production and, you know, trying to find solutions um, that were not also honored, uh, I just drew some clear boundaries that like, I can't, I'm, I'm not, not even I can't, I just will not do this anymore. Mm -hmm. So was somebody taking your food that was specifically designated for you or? So I did have specific designated areas and um, I can't say it was like a specific somebody. What I can say is that, right, you live in a space with like 21 other people, right? Yeah. And um, not everybody, right, is also going to take, right, what somebody else's experiences as seriously as they would if it were themselves, right? So if there's something that has somebody's name on it, right, you don't think like, oh, if I take this, right, this person might not get food for another three days because with COVID protocols, um, going to the grocery store takes, you know, 48 to 72 hours for something that you've eaten of mine to get replaced. So it's not even like, oh, I just ate something of hers. It's no big deal. It's like, okay, well, you've eaten something and now it's going to take me three days to get it replaced. So until then, what do I have to eat? Yeah. So it was, it was things like that. And so there's a lot of anger that comes with that because it's just like, because of my experience, I apply a lot of the golden rule, you know, just like if that doesn't have my name on it, I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if it has somebody else's name on it, I'm definitely not going to touch it. <laughs> so you feeling betrayed definitely had to feel or play a part in uh, that kind of, um, you know, speech that you gave, right? Because was it was everybody kind of said like okay you know we're not voting you or somebody told you that they weren't voting for you and then everybody on the spot kind of blindsided you in a way did that contribute as well yeah um it was a contributing factor um to hear that you're not going to be voted for and thinking that this is an accurate statement because you've heard it multiple times not just one you know, somebody's assuring you um, that one thing is not going to happen. And then you're like, OK, so you don't even mentally prepare for it. So, again, now it's just like I have I have not eaten. Right. So I'm supposed to now right after you told me. Right. And I've had a ha I'm, I have a handful of cashews in my pocket. That's what I've got in my pocket while I wait until we film this elimination and probably get home at 1 a.m. and maybe can make myself a snack before I have to wake up in five hours to go to the next thing that we do. Okay, like this is literally like what this experience is like. And so you you hear that you don't have to prepare for this. And I know that everybody's like, stay ready and you don't have to get ready. But you're like, there was no way to get ready because <laughs> I had no fucking food and... <laughs> Motherfuckers told me that I was good. So to hear um, the complete opposite of that, yes, was, you know, it was it was a blind side. And again, being as hangry as I was, I'm obviously also not thinking properly. And so there were moments that at first I was like, yeah, I'm totally going to do this shit. And then by the time I put my uniform on to change into it, I had decided that I absolutely was not going to do that shit. Mm -hmm. 
Now, how hard was it for you to, you know, obviously watch that episode unfold? Because obviously you live something out and then you have to like relive it X amount of times later. And in the world of reality TV, your fate is essentially left up to whatever the, uh, you know, editing team decides to um, piece that together. You know what I'm saying? So in terms of like chronological order and then like the narrative, you know, fans are going to perceive whichever way they want to perceive it, you know? So how hard maybe was it for you, you know, heading into that experience and then having to like relive that moment? Was it for you? Um, so this was, this is a very layered question because my experience from the real world, I didn't really have to navigate social media the way that you would now. Um, and I also did a really good job of avoiding um, watching any of my stuff, my ex- television experiences, right? Um, and so this one, to see this unfold and then experience it with, you know, a lot of people's opinions, right, based upon, like, an edit, and you're like, wow, like, this, you know, on one hand, you're like, okay, like, there has to be some logic, right? Like at some point in time, like you, we're all in the same age group generally, right? Like you guys realize that this is like edited. (laughs) You realize that there has to be more to the story. And like, there were some people that were really, I mean, saying some really atrocious things to me um, online about that. And that was something that was an interesting um, thing to be able to navigate because you, you realize that, you know, people get so emotionally charged over um, information that they don't have any clear cut, you know, like amount to, to really go off of. And they make these huge, gross assumptions about you and your character, your your personal life. And they say these and they find you. They, they make these decisions and they, they go through all of these steps to get to the nasty message right? Which is, you know, like, I'm going to find your name and type it in and then type this message and have this opinion. And so there were people that really felt a specific type of way about that with no real concept of what that experience was like. And that was something that, as I sit here and speak to you about it now, was not the easiest thing to deal with, especially knowing what I personally went through. It's just like, wow, you guys didn't even give an opportunity to show a a modicum of what that was for me. And And I had to imagine, you know, for someone like yourself, you know, where your two previous shows kind of took place in an era where social media was almost taboo in a way, you know, to kind of uh, now just resurface in such a social media heavy time that we're living in. And uh, I've, with reality TV and like mainly, you know, like challenge, like it always like struck me kind of like, um, like weird in a way how like fans can see like condensed, obviously a condensed, you know, show and then formulate like this, like deep, of like mm-hmm. emotions and like feelings you know what i'm saying it like it's yeah. not uh you know like those the type of emotions are supposed to be like things that captivate you in like a movie that's like actually yes supposed to, yes it's like real yes. you know so that mm-hmm. never really uh i never really quite understood that but we don't get a chance to talk about it I I really think that there needs to be a platform for people because we talk about our experience, right? But we don't really talk about like what our relationship to the aftermath is and what that does for us, right? And how that takes a toll on certain people and how how much of a personality, right? Um, Strength you have to have to be able to be able to endure this, right? And, And put it in a compartment right where you where you're the one that realizes like okay they have no idea what this really is so like I'm just gonna like not even let this affect me and that's the place that I had to get to and once I got there um now I'm like it's a total different game for me because it's just like I had to change I have zero expectation now to um have anybody 
have the amount of empathy or compassion or like logical relation to what reality television experience is for somebody that participates in it. Right. And so like the onus is actually now on me to say, you know, for the people that don't get it, um, I can't expect them to. And so therefore their opinions mean nothing to me. Right. Respectfully. <laughs> Respectfully. Yeah, respectfully. Mm-hmm. But I'm curious to hear like your opinion on this now. And I think um, a lot of people were curious as well is because TJ obviously, you know, had his little choice of words after your exit. Did did he at all, you know, reach out or retract or apologize in any way, shape or form after the fact, finding like the details that have come or no? No, TJ has not said anything. Um, I'm positive that, um, you know, this isn't high on his priority list um, to come and make amends with, um, you know, him also having limited um, or whatever knowledge that he had based upon my experience. And he's there to make entertainment. Um, Do I have any expectation that TJ is going to um, say, oh, wow, like she had a really unique and an experience that I can't recall any challenger being subjected to? Um, I would love to see anybody, anybody that has, you know, something to say about what my experience was or my performance do exactly what I did, but do better, like make it to the final and then win. Do it. Then come talk and have an opinion, you know, until then, like, you know, like literally, like if you can survive off like wishes and cashews, like I'd love to see it. Otherwise, like, you know, so for somebody like TJ, I don't have any expectation for him to kind of step outside because he, um, at least in terms of where the women are concerned, I haven't seen him um, have the same, hold the same energy for women participating that he holds for men. And so I keep my expectations for him fairly low because based upon what I've seen and my personal experience, you know, he's doing exactly what he does, which is, you know, coddle men and hold women to a different standard. And that was going to segue into my next point, which is, do you feel like there is like a glaring inconsistency when it comes to the men and women on this show? I mean, it's so obvious and it's just, it it gets to a point where at, at what time are we going to acknowledge it? And then just like kind of even the playing field, um, to a degree where it's just like reasonable. And I, I'm not one of those people that's like men and women need to be fully equal or what have you. Men have different strengths than women. Okay. I know that exists. Um, but with that being said to kind of put women in kind of this category where, you know, they have to compete in this certain way and then obviously give men, Um, you know, different leeways and different excuses. It's, I mean, it's, it's a little sad and pitiful to see, you know, when I look at the calendar and see that these types of things are still happening. Um, And I would love to see an evolution at that point um, to where people are just like, let's apply logic. And if we're going to expect the women to behave this way, we're going to expect the men to behave this way. Like, let's keep the same energy for our expectations. And not for nothing, too, but just, like, to provide, like, a little more context, like, it seems like a recurring situation, too, like, when people cheat on these shows, like, for instance, and, like, you know, pardon my French here, but, like, you know, when the guys aren't, you know, keeping their junk in their pants, it's cool, mm-hmm. but when the girls do it, it's the storyline of the season, but nobody, Absolutely. but, you know, it just seems like when the girls do it, um, that it's a focal point when the guys it's like all oh, this guy is like and it's a and, and it's a laugh it's a laugh it gets laughed off absolutely there's there's a responsibility at some point in time for the people that are creating this content to recognize what type of narratives they are creating and highlighting right and that goes across the board 
And if we're going to do better and be better and have expectations of everybody walking better lines, then everybody needs to be held accountable for like, you know, dumb shit that they shouldn't be doing now. And it also comes from people opening their mouth. You have to not be afraid to speak when you see some shit that like, when you see math, not mathing, you need to raise your hand and be like, I'm sorry, these calculations aren't specifically adding up to me. So like, let's figure out, you know, where, where, where we're going wrong. And that I think is something that's starting to happen at least um, now with a lot of us. We're using our voices and realizing what should be fixed and what should be addressed. And then making the choice to also not participate if some shit just doesn't sit right with our spirit, or at least me personally. If it doesn't sit right with my spirit, I have the choice to not subject myself to it. Yeah, definitely. I was curious too because after you know obviously you made your statement on instagram following the episode veronica kind of chimed in too in the comments section and I, that came kind of out of left field for a lot of people like what where did that come from do you feel like was there anything underlying between you guys because i didn't really see why she chimed in um yeah i can't really speak for why veronica felt the need to wake up that morning and get involved um with the comments that she made because there was, you know, an undertone um, there that was questionable for me. But in terms of like the resolution, I just, I do feel like there is a part of people that when they don't kind of really grasp something, their first um, instinct is to make a joke about it. Right. And so she was probably looking to get a few likes and laughs right on the internet by trying to make a joke on my expense but that falls flat um you Mm -hmm. know it it fell very flat yeah what what are your beliefs though because obviously we talk about zen and you know we Mm -hmm. saw it come up at the reunion a little bit and like how would you characterize your you know beliefs at the moment like in religion well, clearly I'm a witch, Mike Lewis. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm joking, but um, my spiritual beliefs just kind of are a range of things that I've taken from my ancestral roots. So um, my family, I have Choctaw Indian. I am, I have Yoruban. Um, from African descent, and I have Italian Catholic, and all of these things kind of play a part. Um, I just take what fits and what resonates with me, right, and what I connect with, and I've just started to live by a certain mind frame that things of a high vibration, right, make me feel good, and so I go toward things like that, nature, animals, trees, plants, crystals, um, keeping a really nice, energetically cleansed space with organic foods and vegetables. These are all things that are high vibrational and lead to a high vibration. I try to really stay with a lot of positive thoughts, keeping in alignment with love because, you know, that's where a lot of magic happens. And I've seen that directly. Um, I'm a testament to that in my life. And so my beliefs just kind of are in alignment with being a good person and trying to be like a better version every day and leaving the earth and the people that I encounter, right, better than I found it. And that being my mark on the world. And so like, there's like no religion to that. There's no specific God that I, you know, there's nothing like that. It's just, you know, things that are good and of goodness and peace is really what drive me at this stage in my life. Well said. I don't think, I don't take it that you're, you. uh, uh, I don't take it that you're <laughs> I don't take it that you're a witch then. Good. We're good. 
Good, <laughs> good. I hope that I cleared it. I hope that I made it clear what I am. I'm just a spiritual person having a human experience right now. <laughs> <laughs> So, so now let me ask you, because I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I mean, I saw one of your tweets the other day, and we were talking about a specific dream. But when I say dream, you know, it in, your dream included some of your castmates. But there was a few that were missing. So I'm trying to piece together the puzzle here. And does that mm-hmm. dream at all coincide with a potential real-world homecoming? <laughs> Uh, well, I'd be a liar uh, if I denied that. There's obviously since the real world, New York did their homecoming. It's come up in plenty of topics of conversation. It's only natural for it to come up, especially because we're coming up on 20 years ourselves. So yeah, um, I, I feel like something something is sparking in the ether that I, you know will at some point reunite with my with my group and whether that is in front of the camera or not in front of the camera still remains to be seen but i definitely know that i'm going to see them again well i mean uh bryn was a little more blunt with her response but <laughs> mm-hmm. oh bryn bryn is backwards blunt with her <laughs> response <laughs> she's swisher that- sweets blunt <laughs> I might I might use black uh, backwards. backwards blunt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My uh <laughs> wow, first mm-hmm. time. Yeah. Um but uh thank you again for taking the time to do this. Um I appreciate you um you know hopping on here today, maybe clearing the uh air maybe on some questions people had and um you know just promoting your uh business. You got a lot of cool things coming up I wanna support you with. And um Thank you. It was uh it was a blast. Thank you so much for your time, Mike. Um, such a pleasure to talk to you. And I look forward to this coming out and hearing hearing this. So keep me posted, okay? <laughs> All right, I will. Thank you. Have a have a good rest of your day. All right, you too, my dear. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.